tropical paradise in the western Pacific known as Micronesia lies a tiny island group called simply Yap. Four main islands, Yap, Mop, Gagil Tamil, and Ramon, all surrounded by a coral reef. Today, like all of Micronesia, under the trusteeship of the United Nations and administered by the United States. This is a land belonging to another age, still barely touched by the ways of our own civilization. These are simple, dignified, extremely sensitive people, mostly Malaysian in origin, a people proud of their customs and traditions, and despite the inroads of the modern world, insistent on retaining them. Not long ago, the United States Coast Guard, to complete its Pacific network of Loran navigation aids, found it necessary to build a station on Yap. The station would include a thousand-foot tower to transmit electronic signals to transoceanic ships and aircraft. But to at least one Yapese, accustomed to the unfilled promises of various forces which had occupied his island home in the past, a thousand-foot tower was clearly impossible. A tower taller than the highest tree on Yap? Nay, 30 times taller than the highest palm. Indeed, a tower to the sky. This is the story of the fulfillment of that promise. Close of the rainy season, the U.S. Coast Guard cutter Kukui arrived at Yap, bearing equipment and supplies to build the Loran Station. But for Dapoi, elder of the village of Kagil, the event signified little. For even before his own time, when Yap was under Spanish rule, there had been momentous comings and goings. In his own lifetime, Dapoy had himself heard other promises. First, the Germans, to build a radio communication station on Yap. Today, the station is only a ruin, its bullet and shell-scarred walls still standing. Then, after World War I, the Japanese came with great ambitions, for the mineral bauxite, it was thought, would be found here in great abundance. Their diggings are still visible, along with rusted equipment, abandoned at the outset of World War II. Beside Yap's long-neglected airstrip remain telltale signs to explain the failure of that promise. Today, the District Trust Territory Headquarters building in Colonia, capital of Yap, is evidence of Dapoi's people living under still another, though different, type of rule a United Nations trusteeship with our own country charged with administering the territory. Comings and goings, like the endless waves of the sea, while Yap remains much as it was more than a century ago. True influences of the outside world have been felt on Yap, but for every sign of what we call progress, there are a thousand reminders of the refusal of the Yapis to surrender their long-treasured customs and traditions. For example, the men's house, a communal gathering place for the males of each village. Also, a residence for the boys of every family upon reaching adolescence. In addition, in every village, an area in the woods nearby designated as an abode for young girls upon attaining puberty. Then there is the heavy ankle-length grass skirt worn by every Yapese woman, as well as the thu worn by each male from the age of one all the way into and throughout his manhood. One strand for children, two for adolescents, 
and three to denote full manhood, with hibiscus fibers called a kaffir added to the thu to denote virility. And, of course, there is the famed Yapstone money, owned and proudly displayed by every village. More a symbol of wealth than a medium for barter. From giant cartwheel shapes to smaller disks of stone, quarried in the distant Palau Islands many years ago and brought to Yap on rafts towed by outrigger canoes on voyages during which more than a few Yappies lost their lives. The Kukui, despite the boy's skepticism, soon discharged its cargo. Meanwhile, the Yap airstrip, long devoid of activity, suddenly came alive with the arrival of big cargo-carrying planes from Guam and Honolulu, bearing still more equipment for the Loran station. Load after load of Loran transmitting and receiving gear arrived, shipped all the way from the States, halfway around the world, to this island outpost in the Western Pacific. With the help of a ground crew that included Yapese employees, equipment and materiel were stacked in an outdoor storage area to await there before being transported to the construction site of the station on Gagiltmeal Island. Dense jungle growth, result of 20 years of neglect, was steadily pushed aside to reveal an old road from Tagarin Canal across Gagil Tamil Island, a road that would soon open the island to vehicular traffic, that would provide the people of this area with access to the canal and the island of Yap, all the way to the capital, Colonia, often called Yap Town. A native material good for topping the road was found on the island. As each stretch of road was completed, it was quickly surfaced with a topping. Soon, under pressure to complete the project, the way lay open from the Yap airstrip to the canal, separating the islands of Yap and Kogil to Meal, then to the site of the Loran station. To Dapoi, the new road was a pleasing sight. Building a road, however, was one thing, a tower to the sky, clearly another. Meanwhile, the station site itself began to hum with activity. First, clearing the land. Surveying the site. At length, final grading. Side by side, Yapis, Palauans, and Filipino nationals dug the trenches for the building foundations. To guard against the effects of typhoons, a common occurrence in this area of the Pacific, all structures would be of reinforced concrete, with steel bars installed in all of the foundation footings, then carefully welded together so that every building would be grounded in order to avoid affecting reception and transmission of the Loran signals. As for Dapoi and his people, life went on as usual. occasional visits to nearby relatives. For the youngsters, the welcome moment of release from school. At home, the women, while their men fished at sea, kept their yards spick and span, their outdoor cooking areas immaculately clean. Yet life on Yap, in many respects a Garden of Eden, is lived at an easy pace. With fruits of the forest and fish from the sea free for the people, theirs simply for the taking. Papaya, bananas, 
coconuts, breadfruit, and pineapples. Also, the roots of the taro plant that grows in overflowing abundance in many areas of Yap. Now and then, a moment of sadness enters the life of the Yapese. On this occasion, a memorial service for long departed chieftains, extolling their greatness while mourning the passing of their spirits. As a sign of their respect, as well as to bless the service, the males of the village bring their shell money for high-ranking chiefs. Strings of large, flat oyster shell tokens called yar. These they deposit along the roadside at the village center. The Yapis, however, cannot remain sad too long. Here, one of their traditional folk dances, known as the stick dance. It's flexible choreography telling a particular story, worked out in this instance by the boy, dancing master for the Gagil school group. For an audience that includes visiting United Nations Trust Territory officials. Even during the dry season, sudden squalls appear, violent downpours five or six times a day, turning the construction site for the Loran station into a sea of mud. For a time, it seemed that Dapoi's prophecy about the impossibility of erecting a tower to the sky would come true. Just as swiftly as the rains come, Yap's warm sunshine returns. Time now for pouring the cement for the building foundation. cement block or two. And in a few days, it grows into a wall as the signal power building of the Loran station begins to assume shape. Like most Japanese jealous of their privacy, Dapoe was also respectful of the privacy of others. But his own wonder about the strange happenings on his island one day got the best of it. A building of concrete masonry strong enough to weather a typhoon was not entirely new to Depoy. He had seen others in Colonia. But where was the much talked about tower to the sky? Depoy saw giant fuel tanks being assembled. Their plates pre-cut to size, easily joined together. Each tank would hold 30,000 gallons of diesel oil for the generators of the signal power building to create the enormous amounts of electricity required for Loran operations. Still, this was not the reason for Dapoi's visit. In the distance, in a staging area of the camp, lay the components for the Loran antenna. Brace by brace. Leg by leg, bolt by bolt, the base section of the antenna tower was assembled. Dapoi saw this huge framework of steel, but it lay stretched on the ground, not as was promised, destined for the sky, taller than the highest palm, as high as a bird flies in a realm where man can only trespass on the spirit world. The great majority of the Yapis profess Christianity. 
90% of them Roman Catholic. Yet local gods, as well as magic rites, remain embedded deep in their culture. With ancestral and other spirits dwelling in sacred groves, as well as in the heavens, approachable only by magicians. The next day, despite that boy's doubts, erection of the tower began with installation of the base insulator. With the base completed, the first section was now ready to be set into position. Then the gin pole, key to tall tower construction, was rigged. Anchored onto the side of the tower, it would, simultaneous with the growth of the structure, be progressively jumped, thus enabling it to continue to hoist section after section of steel into place. First a red-colored, now a white-colored section, rising skyward with the aid of the gin pole. Perched high in the structure, a team of tall tower erection men, accustomed to working at great heights, join the legs of the various sections together. Working against time, not only to meet the deadline for opening of the station, but also to beat the oncoming rainy season, when from May to November, Yap is subjected to day-long wind-driven downpours with up to 30 inches of rain falling each month. Section after section, each a 30-foot length of steel framework will be fixed in place with a tower now more than 100 feet high. At length, the tower is ready for its first set of permanent guys. To hold the tower erect, 1,000 feet tall when finished, it would have five sets of guys each at a different elevation, with a set of three 1,000-pound insulators on the bottom guy, strung on prefabricated inch-thick cable. As the cable is spun out, the insulators head toward their hookup point high on the tower structure. By means of a giant U-bolt at the terminal of the guy, the cable is now drawn to its ground anchor. With all U-bolts installed, slowly exerting equal tension of up to 40,000 pounds on all three guys, the giant insulators are drawn away from the tower, helping to hold secure a structure, when completed, of 300 tons of steel enabling it to withstand typhoon winds of 150 miles per hour and more. Indeed, enabling it to outlast Apoi and his descendants for generations to come. Some weeks after his first visit, Apoi returned to the construction site. From his palm frond basket, he took the makings of his beetle quid, a stimulant widely used in the Western Pacific. Nuts of the areca palm, pepper leaves powdered with white lime. Through education, a diminishing practice among the Yappies, but still clung to by this elder of Gagil village. Dapoy was now ready to satisfy his curiosity. What had happened in the intervening weeks on land still owned by neighboring families of Tapoy? Land leased by agreement to the United States for a fee. Tapoy was amazed by what he saw. Huge fuel tanks had been mounted on piers. 
floors and walls of buildings had been completed. Trenches had been dug for the water, power, and electronic control lines, and interconnecting all buildings on the site were now being installed. In the still roofless signal power building, one of the generators was being set in place. Then the control panel, distribution point of electric power for Loran equipment. Later, the roof would be installed. For each building in tune with this typhoon-proof construction, pre-stressed concrete beams, along with a concrete overhang spanning the entire width of the building. Soon, the last leg of construction, installation of windows, painting, then final touch-up. In the signal power building, with the control panel hooked up and ready to operate, it was checked. Next, costly, highly sensitive Loran timing and recording equipment was moved in. Now a dry run to check out every item of electronic equipment. First, starting up the bank of generators, throwing a heavy load on the line. The Loran equipment was found in perfect working order requiring only completion of the antenna tower to perform its function. In the days that followed, with time growing short before the onset of the rainy season, the tower grew by leaps and bounds. 300, 400, 600 feet as the gin pole was jumped again and again. Then, 800 feet. And now, only a few sections remain to be added to the structure. After months of sweat and struggle, the last of the 30-foot sections was hoisted to be fixed into place. Finally, to cap this achievement of man's engineering on this tiny island in the Western Pacific, the tower platform be mounted atop the structure was hoisted. For Dapoi on his next visit to the site, wonder of wonders, the unbelievable had actually taken place. By now, the signal power, as well as transmitter buildings, had been completed. Also, the barracks, fuel tank farm, and pump house. All that remained was to commission this new unit of United States Coast Guard facilities into service. Awaiting the start of the commissioning service was the station crew at Muster. From Guam and Honolulu had come high-ranking officers of the Coast Guard and Navy. From Colonia, officials of the District Trust Territory Headquarters. From Gagil and other villages in the area had come Yapis men and women with their children. Dapoi, in full ceremonial dress, complete with wooden comb to mark his family rank, was given a place of honor beside the commanding officer of the new Loran station. As the commander of the 14th Coast Guard District delivered the principal address, officially placing the station into service. To commemorate the event, Dapoi had created a story told and danced by the Gagil school group. The dance described the occasion. On this island, a promise given, a promise kept.
tower constructed higher than the tallest palm. Nay, 30 times higher than the most majestic palm on the islands of Yat. A tower reaching into a realm where the bird flies, where the spirits of Dapoi's ancestors dwell. Truly, a tower to the sky. To Dapoi, the tower meant even more. More than the employment it had given his fellow islanders. More than the new bridge built by the Coast Guard, connecting the islands of Yap and Dagil's Meal. More than the new road built across the island, triggering the construction of other new roads by the Trust Territory Administration even more than the money it had brought the families of Gagil Tamil for their land use rights. To a people and a land subject to successive colonizations in the past century, it meant that strangers had come recently with a purpose. Coming not as an occupying force, but as guests, paying careful respect to the feelings and to the rights of their hosts, to their customs and traditions careful not to disrupt their native way of life as they carried out their purpose. Meanwhile, doing all in their power to build a bond of mutual trust and friendship, a bond hopefully to continue far into the future. Before setting out for his home, Dapoi came to take a last look at a sight his eyes beheld, but which his mind had yet fully to accept. A tower that seemed to project a bold promise. For the wayfarer, security on the seas and in the air, as well as a better life for Dapoi and for all the people of Yak.